good evening. Oh, y'all can do better than that. I said good evening. That's what I'm talking about. My name is Aaron Grayson, um, and the Stanford Resilience Project welcomes you to Stanford I Screwed Up 2016. I am so excited to introduce our MC and host for tonight. While she was here, she directed the Vagina Monologues, was on the leadership committee for Charity Fashion Show, and produced Blackfest, just to name a few of the things she's done today, or this uh, during her undergraduate career. Since graduation, she has founded the online platform Grown Up Truth, a lifestyle publication dedicated to millennial life. Here's your host for tonight from the great class of 011, Lexi B. Good evening. Let's try that again. Good evening. Fantastic. My name is Lexi B. I'd like to welcome you to Stanford I Screwed Up. Tonight is about celebrating the accomplishments and the failures that have led us to resilience. And before we get started, I'd like to have a few housekeeping items. Firstly, welcome to Meyer Green. Isn't it gorgeous? Yeah. So we please ask that let's keep it gorgeous and let's respect our space. So all these little strub, scrubs, <laughs> strubs, please don't tackle them. Please pick up all after yourself throughout the event. Secondly, I would like to ask all of your cell phones to be turned off, silenced, or on vibrating, just to respect the performers. They're coming out here doing some really brave pieces, and we want to make sure they're not distracted. Finally, as you have probably have seen, we have cameras and photographers all throughout the event. I completely understand if you do not want to be on camera right now. So please, if you see one coming your way, just duck. Tonight, like I said before, we are celebrating resilience, and to do that, we have to honor the failures that have helped develop that resilience. The Resilience Project at Stanford University wants us to understand, embrace, and experience those failures in order to embrace our true, authentic self. There are gonna be some hard topics that we're gonna discuss tonight through these performances, and at any time, if you feel a little uneasy, please find the volunteers, they're in blue shirts, they're all throughout the back, and they can take care of you. Now I'd like to introduce our first performer. And she's an extraordinary woman because she not only is brave, but she was a very key part in bringing this event to you. Without her hard work, Stanford Screwed Up would not exist. So please give me a warm welcome, a loud welcome, for Abby Balani. Dear Ms. Bellani, we regret to inform you that you will not be offered a place at the School of Medicine for the upcoming year. The large number of applications we receive for a relatively small number of places means that many fine candidates cannot be admitted. The admissions committee joins me in wishing you well in your future medical career. No one ever tells you how it feels to read rejection. No one prepares you for the moment when 10, 20, 30 letters roll in telling you you're not good enough. No one ever tells you how many people read letters telling them that they're not good enough. People shrug their shoulders and say, man, these processes are so arbitrary, or babe, I'm so sorry. That must be so scary. But I'm not just scared, I'm unprepared. I am the girl with no direction. I used to walk with my head held high, bright-eyed, standing tall, and now I'm looking down for the first time as I struggle to find each foothold one at a time. No one ever tells you how to find a new trail. And I wish that someone would come along, grab me by the shoulders, and point me towards a brighter horizon. Or better yet, teach me how to read the maps, the charts, and the stars above so that I can begin to guide myself. I did my first dissection when I was 10 years old. I was first aid certified at 13. I learned how to suture by my 16th birthday, and I took my first research job at 17. Being a doctor, you could say, was inevitable. But you know what's incredible about the inevitable is that confidence gives you the chance to dance around every opportunity with impunity, and I found that I had so many new things to try. But the skills section of my resume lists only procedures and certificates. 
The skills section of my resume doesn't say the number of times that I've turned tears into laughter or how I've put band-aids over broken hearts. The skills section of my resume doesn't say that I always win taboo and cards against humanity or that I know how every member of my family takes their tea. The skills section of my resume doesn't say that I can find the perfect metaphor to describe just about anything or that I once talked a girl out of committing suicide. The skills section of my resume definitely won't say that today I stood up in front of a crowd of strangers and told them a poem about my biggest failure. These are the charts I'm learning to read. I'm learning to know myself beyond the boxes I can check off in an, on an application, unconstrained, unrefined, and unafraid. Well, getting there. Let me be the first to tell you how it feels to read rejection. Let me be the first to tell you how it feels to hear I'm not good enough. Let me be the first to say that when what you thought was inevitable starts slipping away, it just sucks. But the thing about charting a new course after a fall is you start to realize that underneath it all, you were preparing yourself all along. And those charts, those maps, even the stars, you wrote them all. Dear admissions officer, I regret to inform you that I will not be applying for a place at the School of Medicine for the upcoming year. The large number of opportunities that I am privileged enough to have available to me means that many more paths can be considered. Thank you for your well wishes. I truly do appreciate your consideration and your encouragement. Dear Ms. Bellani, stand tall. It's interesting how rejection can easily become an opportunity for a different path. And I want all of you to recognize that tonight. Our next performer, her name is Meredith Charlson, and we'd like to welcome her to the stage along with her amazing dance troupe, the Robley Dance Troupe. Hi, everyone. My name is Meredith Charlson, and I just graduated from Stanford University. Thanks, guys. Uh, this piece is entitled When in Doubt, Mark C. It is an excerpt from a longer piece that I choreographed two years ago called Painting the Roses Red that explored academic pressures and stresses among high school students. This particular section looks at the relentlessness of standardized multiple choice testing in high schools, and all of the movement material that you see in this piece is based upon actual SAT and AP exam questions. The subject of testing particularly appealed to me because I absolutely hated taking exams in high school. I was not a fabulous test taker, perhaps because I would argue with the exams a lot. I didn't understand why I had to choose one correct answer when I was sure that there were many other ways to answer those questions. Generally, I felt like an overwhelming proportion of my high school experience centered around this test anxiety and frustration. Consequently, when I came to Stanford, I decided to study comparative literature so that I wouldn't have to take any more multiple choice exams. A lot of you may begin to watch this piece and want to ask, what does it mean? However, when I first workshopped the piece, I found that it resonated quite differently with different people, depending on their relationship with their own ex experiences of academic stress in high school and beyond. While watching this piece, allow yourself to experience it differently from the person next to you, and know that is all right. For this piece, there is no correct answer. Thank you. Advanced Placement Examination, United States History, Section 1, Question 13. In his farewell address, President Dwight D. Eisenhower warned Americans about the dangers of A. Presidential candidate Richard M. Nixon B. Communist subversion of the civil rights movement C. The military-industrial complex D. The lack of a national health insurance program Congratulations! Answer C is the correct response. Next question. Question 65. By the end of the 17th century, which of the following was true of women in New England? A. They had begun to challenge their subordinate role in society. B. They were the majority in many church congregations. C. They voted in local elections. D. They frequently divorced their husbands. 
I'm sorry. Answer D is incorrect. The correct response is answer B. Next question. Question 71. The Taft-Hartley Act did which of the following? A. Established wage and price controls during the Nixon administration. B. Protected American manufacturers from European competition during the Depression. C. Limited the powers of labor unions. D. Created the interstate highway system. I'm sorry, answer B is incorrect. No, I'm sorry, answer D is also an incorrect response. The correct response is either answer A or answer C. Do you care to guess? Let's give it up for Meredith and her dance troupe. I don't know about you, but I took the SATs a very, very long time ago, and I don't want to take them ever again. Like ever, ever, ever again. Our next performer, she is the most darling person I have ever met in the past 24 hours. 
Her name is Hannah Broderick. Please give her a round of applause. Congratulations. The admission committee joins me in the most rewarding part of my job, offering you admission to Stanford University and inviting you to join our class of 2018. Friday, March 28, 2014 at 3 p.m., I remember the exact time, found me letting out a big, huge cry of celebration, the ramifications of which prompted the next door neighbors to come running. The door to a future was swinging open and I was ready to run, leap, and bound through it. Fast forward to September 2014, moving into Arroyo with a depressed father and an overcompensating mother. So much love in such a small space, suffocation at the prospect of being together or alone, I cried to myself in the shower that night. How college cliche. A week went by, and between drinking alcohol for the first time, getting lost every time I left my dorm room, and being swept away on a wave of possible classes, I realized a decision had to be made. Stanford was amazing, so welcoming and vibrant, but after seven days, I knew I wasn't ready or able to meet it and its opportunities with arms thrown wide open. So I decided to withdraw for a year, the process of which involved signing two pieces of paper and booking a flight back home to Hawaii. Meyer Library hadn't been torn down yet, and it felt like the sky was falling as I sat out in the sun and called my mom. She flew up yet again, this time bringing me back a box of Manapua and a Plumeria Lay from Lita's Lay Stand. The smells and tastes of the past and future reminding me that I was going back to love and support. And so the two of us came together a second time under the shadow of Hoover Tower. It didn't take me long to label my decision a failure. In my mind's reality, I had failed to handle the changes of a new place populated with new people and new experiences. I had failed to be a strong Hannah. I wrote angry poetry for a month after leaving Stanford, rewatched Korean dramas, and didn't bother to read the subtitles, just streams of images moving across my screen. I left my room only to pad into the kitchen and spoon Nutella onto graham crackers. A constant flow of relatives visited to tell me I had worth, and for what seemed like ages, I refused to hear them. The desire to develop a spiritual practice in order to understand my unraveling family life led me to Chanteloube, a Buddhist monastery in the Dordogne province of France. An utter Buddhist novice, I was taken into the legacy of Lama Jigma Kinza Rinpoche, son of Kangyo Rinpoche, and brother to Tuku Pamawango and Rangjo Rinpoche. Incredible teachers, these three brothers steered me toward acceptance of self and deep compassion for others. Surrounded by routine, ritual, and people who knew themselves and what they needed, I was exposed to a deep way of thinking that was connected to understanding of self found in hour-long morning meditations, tending to our communal garden, walking around the stupa or Buddhist temple, and painting satsas, small statues of the Buddha. Sometimes we would paint these satsas for, for six hours on end. The monks and nuns that lived with me reminded me that comfort with self precedes comfort with other, and that enlightenment stems from within. This place, these people, and our experiences together enabled me to truly believe that I could define my own worth. I began to see my failure as something I needed, as something I hadn't been able to ask for myself. My failure offered me a break, a chance to put down the textbooks and scrape my knees on new experiences, to finally be vulnerable with myself and those people who were most important to me. When I think back on my failure now, again as a freshman at Stanford, I rename it as an opportunity, and I am thankful for the time and focus that it gifted me. We are thrilled to offer you admission. Welcome to the Stanford family. Now I'd like to bring on stage the Stanford Gospel Choir. It started in 1978 at Stanford with a group of students who wanted to express their spirituality in such an amazing way. So please give it up for the Stanford Gospel Choir. Because of your love 
Give another hand for the Stanford Gospel Choir. And now we have a very special guest. He doesn't know that I'm doing this yet, but rumor has it he's an RA in West Flomo. Is there anyone here that's from Flomo? So you guys might know this person, right? His name is Skylar Cohen. Let's give it up for the RA at West Flomo, Skylar. When I first came to Stanford, my passion was strong. But I see looking back, I could not be more wrong. The way that I saw things, I will be emphatic and say that my attitude was too pragmatic. To myself, I said, success depends on the number of units, not the number of friends. And so the year flowed day by day. I made new friends and felt okay. I was grateful for them, but I still had my creed. Without good-looking grades, one just couldn't succeed. 
And thus, looking back upon that start, I use my brain, but not my heart. And I push through my work and I try to survive, but a feeling of emptiness would soon arrive. That summer, to my home I went. With clinical research, that summer I spent. And through the geographic strain, I failed to most friendships maintain. I started the next year with great expectations. The challenge of new classes brought me elation. But I looked at my dorm on the web and I saw. The rooms were all fine, but the place had a flaw. The dorm was removed from main campus, far flung. I would rarely see old friends. In my heart, that thought stung. During fall quarter, my resolve declined. I was often alone. I was in such a bind. My parents and dorm mates did their best to be kind, but I drowned in self-pity, trapped deep in my mind. I have never felt pain like the pain that had grown when I faced a long night of the silence alone. I went on like this until finals I had. I left back for home, feeling pensive and sad. So I pulled back and thought, and I could plainly see that to fix the way things worked, I had to fix me. I was in a state that I could not endure. I had to admit the way things truly were. My work was important, but never would cease. If life is a puzzle, the school is just one piece. And with just that one piece, life is filled with dead ends. In order to thrive, you must find joy with friends. Those thoughts were momentous, but then it got tough. I had to go deeper. That was not enough. There was only one path. There was only one way. I had to accept the fact that I am gay. <laughs> then I went back to school. I had six months ahead, but little by little, I pushed back my dread. I reached out to old friends and rekindled the spark that brings out the light in a world filled with dark. I also made new friends. I could not complain. New friendships I made would be ones I sustain. I started to come out. It felt very strange to do something so bold that would bring me such change. I came out more often and the fear never faded, but each time I did it, I felt more elated. The year felt quite long, but despite its long length, I came out more often. My heart grew in strength. Then I had enough strength to surmount all my fear. I came out to my parents at the end of the year. I feared this could rend all of my hope apart. But it was not the end. It was only the start. With warm hearts, they heard what I hid for so long. The love that we shared stayed unbroken and strong. Last summer brought change, but I was not afraid. I was here doing research. On campus, I stayed. My summer dorm was tight-knit. In those months, we found unity. I was grateful to make friends in such a community. I found it could work and could also make friends. I found a new balance on which I depend. It gave me a chance that I think that I earned to start from square one with the lessons I learned. As I entered my third year, my life would change more. I would staff as an RA in charge of a floor. I decided to come out to all that I knew. I would post it on Facebook, that is what I would do. By using the web as a way to display, I could come out to old friends who lived far away. I'd been building up strength, now I needed it most. It took so much strength just to click the word post but I could finally feel free wherever I went. I was openly gay, to me so much it meant. It was all overwhelming, but I had to try. I could follow my feelings instead of deny. That brings us to here, and I'll finish with how. My worldview has changed in the here and the now. Truly cherish your friends. With them, things will be right. Your classes might grow dark, but friends are the light. And believe in yourself. You must do so with pride. Both you that you show and the you that you hide. Thank you. So this next performer, she's very interesting and she doesn't know this yet, but when I came to do this show and to MC this show, we had a rehearsal and I walked in not knowing anyone in the rehearsal. Um, I'm class of 2011, so I'm really old. And she walked in and she told me her story and I have to, I have to give it to her because um, she is the one that I think that I resonate most with. 
a woman, an incredible woman who's not only an athlete but a performer and is always on that tin that we call it. And there's this perfectionism aspect about her that makes her so beautiful. And so please welcome to the stage, Hannah Levy. Hello there. <laughs> I'm a rower on the lightweight crew team. Last year I thought I had a pretty good chance of making a lineup for nationals, but I faltered and I ended up becoming the alternate. The way I screwed up is not because I was alternate, it's how I let my mindset change and how I perceived myself afterwards. I let myself feel inadequate, like I had no value to my team and like I would have no effect on the outcome. I was jealous of those who made the boat and I was angry at myself for not. And because I felt like I was no longer a part of the outcome, I stopped trying as hard. By thinking I had no value or effect and acting like I had no value or effect, I was undermining an aspect of myself that I had complete control over, my attitude. I wanted to be a champion. I wanted to relish in the victory that was mine, wear a medal around my neck, take a picture with the trophy, bring back the title. As I stood on the shoreline, watching my team become national champions, I realized I was just lucky enough to be a part of the journey. I had to learn that putting in hard hours, blood, sweat, tears, and hard work, and it was all worth it. And it wasn't a wasted effort just because I didn't get the exact outcome I wanted. You fight through each stroke, and even if you have some off ones, you keep pushing forward. A medal, a title, and a trophy do not define your worth. Your attitude does. Here's a dance to show you what I learned. we strive to be champions, and if we fall short, we're afraid we'll lose it all. We are categorized in boxes, swimmers, runners, gymnasts, rowers, but those are just words, not definitions. We're supposed to be the strongest, the fastest, the fittest. No breaks, no mistakes, no second chances. We are constantly being tested, constantly pushing our limits, constantly facing expectations, constantly trying to improve. We will do whatever it takes for that extra inch, that extra second, that extra point. We stay up too late and wake up too early. We go before practice starts and stay after it ends. What our parents, coaches, friends, fans, and even we are afraid to admit is that we are not always strong. We don't always win. We don't always bring home titles. We aren't always champions. We battle depression. We feel like we aren't enough. We worry about our body image. We wonder why we are here. We are more than words. More than titles. More than trophies. More than medals. Don't let one thing to find you. I am lost. We get tired. We miss home. We have off days. We cry. 
We feel small. We are stressed. We get nervous. We feel pressured. We are scared. We lose. We struggle. But we overcome and we don't give up. At the end of the day, we are athletes. And that is undefinable. Let's give Hannah another round of applause. And now I'd like to welcome someone equally as special as all the other performers. His name is Foster Langstorff. I feel like a lot of people know Foster, and I feel like we should do that again. So Foster Langstorff. So I think Foster, you should come out now. <laughs> I'm not very good live, so go easy. Just kidding. <laughs> good evening, everyone. How are you doing? How many of us truly want to know the honest answer to that when I first asked it? As a freshman, I would have asked that question with little genuine interest as well. Leaving high school meant I could be anyone, so back then I acted like someone who I wasn't. I sported the red backpack, walked around the dorm with the shirt off, wore crazy hats, pretended to be RT, and if you knew me from high school, you would have known I was full of shit. <laughs> In high school, I was goofy, unique. At Stanford, well, I felt boring. I made no friends by acting like I was too cool for dorm meetings and freshman events that Cardinal Council put on. I stuck close to my team and other athletes because it was the easy choice. I didn't have to feel boring, and I didn't have to be unique. Hey, dude, how's practice? Oh, gosh, they made you run a ton? Shit, that sucks. Yeah, man, we play UCLA this week, and they're pretty good, I guess. That was every single one of my conversations. From the outside in, you could say I was an asshole, more eager to talk about myself than ask questions about you. I'd be busy talking about my game and how I played and how tough our coach was, Gunn, and when standing right in front of me was a girl that founded the first AIDS clinic in her country. I mean, can you, can you see the mismatch right there? Pretty, pretty apparent. Um, I, I was completely shallow. I limited my community because I'd already found one within my own team. While I consider them my brothers and I've made very, very many good friends in the athletic community, I wish now that that wasn't all I'd done. I wish I could call my roommate Tony from Arroyo freshman year one of my best friends, but I can't. I wish I'd gone on ski trip to Lake Tahoe instead of playing Call of Duty with my teammates and watching Dexter kill people in my dorm alone. <laughs> and I wish I'd stayed up and had deep late night talks with people like I imagined myself doing and arguing over Settlers of Catan until 4 a.m. Saying, no, you stole, you stole the ore. Or just like, oh, I do that all the time. Um, but but now, now I can't. And it's too late. These events and these opportunities have come and gone, and now I only have empty memories of grueling soccer practices and campus parties. So what I've realized is if you want to get the most out of your experience, you got to show a little bit of leg, and you got to take some risk. Um, if you want to make an omelet, you got to break some damn eggs, okay? Nothing ventured, nothing gained. I'm coming to realize that I'm in an incredible environment where you get what you put out. So what I've realized is you gotta throw that boomerang as hard as you can. So perhaps I'll make myself vulnerable to you now. Can I do this? <laughs> I don't wanna break shit before other people have to use it. So. It's three days until the physics midterm, and I'm enduring a grueling two-hour review session. The TAs, well, they're throwing out topics left to right, like Newtonian mechanics and gravity and F equals MA, and I honestly don't understand shit, and I'm like, at one point it crosses my mind, 
wait, maybe this is the wrong review session? Yeah, this is this can't be the one, but familiar faces quickly proved that wrong. And um, so I had spent the past weeks blowing off all the readings, browsing Facebook, and pretty much doing nothing during lecture and attempting to do the homework in the final hours before it was due. And I sat there at that review session staring at my blank piece of paper and it seemed hopeless to even begin writing anything down. I needed a breath of fresh air to gain some courage to begin learning or at least to keep myself from failing. So, but mainly I just needed to leave the classroom which I did red faced. And so outside the physics tutoring center, I sat there, hands running through my hair. Everything that had been going on for me that week, we'd, we were going to play UCLA, I had girl troubles, and the shit show that was this review session was just ganging up on me all at once. And so pulling my hair even harder and harder, full-fledged freak out, and if you know me, I, you know I freak out. <laughs> I'm staring at the ground, sitting on this bench, swelling up just full of emotion and stress and right as I'm about to burst it happens a sewer snake released <laughs> letting the dogs out now um well my eyes lit up and now but now I, I was just confused I, I mean really did I just shit my pants? I just shit my fucking pants. Wait, this was a feeling I didn't felt since the fifth grade when I didn't make the all-star baseball team. And it's happening to me as a sophomore at school. And the only thing clear to me was, I gotta leave this review session now. And so I began the journey back to FloMo. And if you've been in the PTC, the Physics Tutoring Center, it's over there. It's, it's an uphill bike ride, which I spent laughing and crying like a maniac, a fucking maniac. I'm pretty sure Taurus saw me and just like, Jesus, I don't want to come here anymore. <laughs> and yeah, don't let your kids come here. Um, all I knew, so I'd be, so also, if you know something about FloMo, you know who lives there, Kappa Kappa Gamma. So crab walking, limping past these intimidating Kappa Kappa Gamma girls who I had met briefly, I rushed past them with just this horrified look on my face. And then I did a shower. And I'm, I'm, I was advised not to share with you all the gory details, so I'm not gonna drag you through that. But at that moment, I was so defeated and after hitting an ultimate low point that I was left unintimidated and unafraid, only preoccupied by other things. But I burst, <laughs> I burst into my neighbor's room Molly, Madney, Cindy, Rav, Allison. <sighs> I'd met a handful of time. I'd met these people a handful of time. I just shit my pants. <laughs> so it, it felt so liberating in more ways than one. So simple in the end. Simple, but hard. <laughs> I discovered that telling people who I really am is liberating and that being open to meeting new people, showing them gen genuine interest is rewarding and that I've always felt more comfortable and have made more friends by being the person I am rather than pretending to be someone I'm not. Um, and I understand, and so, sorry, I've, I messed up. Um, <laughs> and that, all right, I understand that I probably won't have deep relationships with all my dorm mates and classmates, but that I will try to interact with them on a real level and in a real way. To be able to give the person time to reflect and say, you know what, Foster, I'm actually having a rough week too. And after losing my father unexpectedly and my grandfather to suicide within the last year and a half, it's, it's good to get the chance to think like, uh, fuck, like, I'm going through a rough week too with you, man. So it has made me more empathetic and not only wanting to hear how different someone's day has gone, but wanting to get to know what's bothering them at the core and how their day is really going. So now I want to give you the opportunity to think about yourself. Wait, how am I doing?
<laughs> hope you're laughing. Because we don't have to wallow in our pity, but we can acknowledge it as friends and help lift one another out of it. So if you see me on campus, which I won't have shit in my pants when you do, hopefully, <laughs> please say hi. And if you ask me how it's going, I'll be honest with you. And all I, all I would expect is that you'd be honest with me. Thank you. Well, that was a lot. <laughs> Take a moment to sink that all in. I now would like to bring up Kyle Foster with Kyle Robinson. I'm sorry. I'd like to bring up Kyle Robinson. Kyle Foster sounds pretty cool too, but her name is Kyle Robinson and she has this wonderful voice and she will be singing actually one of my favorite Barbara Streisand songs of all time. Give it up for Kyle. I'm clearly not this tall, so I'm gonna try to make this work. Okay. Hi everybody, my name's Kyle Robinson, not Foster, but it's okay if you call me the other one, both are fine. And I'm here today to tell you about the first time that I was not the center of attention. So I'm sure to a lot of you that's going to sound really shallow and selfish, so just hear me out and let me tell you my situation a little bit further. So I've been in theater ever since I can remember. I often joke to people that I was singing in the womb, and I live for being on stage. That beautiful warmth of the stage lights illuminating your face, like right now, this is great. And just having the audience cheer for you and laud you after you leave, it's just the best feeling that I've ever felt in my life. I've been the lead in every show that I've ever auditioned for. That is until this year. I auditioned for a show, didn't get a lead. I actually didn't even get in the show. I was so crushed. I'd quit choir this year, so I'd have a lighter schedule, and I declined a lot of other academic opportunities strictly so I could be in this show. I wept for days and I was so incredibly embarrassed by my reaction to this rejection. But this rejection also helped me learn a lot. So not only do I now know that I don't deserve to be in shows, but I've also focused a lot of my energy into being the best performer that I can be. I've decided to join the staff for the show, so I've been working as an assistant costume designer, and although I'm not the center of attention, I'm playing a really critical role that I wouldn't have been able to explore had I been in the show. I may have gotten rejected from one play, and I'm sure that I'll get rejected from a lot more, but the point is that there are just so many people just as and even more talented than me on this campus. So I'm not going to stop trying. Instead, I'm going to keep pushing forward until eventually, hopefully all the pieces will fall together. So now I'm gonna sing a song for you guys. <laughs> Don't tell me not to live, just sit and butter. Life's candy and the sun's a ball of butter. Don't bring her on a clown or eat on my parade. Don't tell me not to fly, I've simply got to. If someone takes a spill, it's me and not you. Who told you you're allowed to eat on my parade? How much my band down? I'll beat my drum. turn at bat, sir. At least I didn't fake it, hat, sir. I guess I didn't make it, but whether I'm the rose of sheer perfection, a freckle on the nose of life's complexion, the sand or the shiny apple of its eye. I gotta fly once, I gotta try once, only can die once, right, sir? Oh, life is Juicy, juicy, and you see, I've got to have my bite, sir. Get ready for me, love, cause I'm a comer. I've simply got to march my heart to drummer. Who told you you're allowed to rain on my parade? I'm gonna live and live now. Get what I want, I know how. One roll for the whole shebang. One throw that bell will go clang. Eye on the target and wham. One shot, one gunshot, and bam! Hello, Stanford. Here I am. How much my
your turn at bat, sir. At least I didn't fake it, hat, sir. I guess I didn't make it. Get ready for me, love, cause I'm a comer. I've simply gotta march my injured to no, and nobody is gonna. Please give Kyle another round of applause. Now I'd like to introduce you to another wonderful performer. Her name is Elisa Lupin Jimenez. Give it up. Oh, a little short for this. <laughs> Stanford, I didn't screw up. I fucked up. And I don't use the word fuck up lightly. This one was a doozy. It's a couple days before Frosh move in 2014. My dad figured we should all drive up the coast on a last minute family vacation. Sounded good at first, but oh yeah, forgot to mention my mom had end stage cancer. Fun times. So halfway through that trip, she fell ill and had to be admitted to a hospital, but I still had to go to college, so my dad drove me up and we left my mom behind. It's safe to say I wasn't particularly stoked for move-in day. I was literally the last kid to show up at the dorm, and sure, I wanted to make new friends, but it couldn't have been a worse time. My mom's condition deteriorated, and she had to be transported via ambulance to the Stanford Hospital. But hey, at least my parents were around now. The first Monday night of classes rolls around, when the freshmen go apeshit, and I was determined to forget about my shitty situation. The night was young. All the people around me were eager to hit the frats, and I was ready to join. I just wanted to be a normal college kid who could party. So remember those online think about it courses that we had to take before coming here? Well, I sure didn't because I was going hard. Maybe it was to impress my peers. Maybe it wasn't an effort to block out my life. Who knows? But around 8 p.m., I was thoroughly tipsy. I got separated from my group and bumped into an acquaintance who pulled out a bar of chocolate about yay big and I could clearly see a marijuana leaf printed on the packaging. Now on a normal day, I probably would have declined the offer, but this was the first night of real college. This was a new Elisa, the one that would be the party animal. So you know what I did? I had about this much. So those of you who aren't familiar with edibles, let me give you a quick rundown. That is a metric fuck ton of concentrated marijuana. About an hour in, I was gonna have the night of my life. I regrouped with my dorm mates and together we went to the row. Tick, tick, tick. Passed by the Cardinal Knights event, laughing about how drunk we were in comparison. Tick, tick. Get to the row, only to find out nothing's actually going on. Tick, bam! That edible hit me like a train. I was literally on my knees, having a panic attack, thinking my mom had died. Somehow I got my shit together and convinced my group I was fine, but walking back to the dorm felt like I was pushing through a vat of syrup, and I forgot how to speak English. When we got back, I suddenly remembered one random fact from those Think About It courses. If you drink alcohol and fall asleep, you could asphyxiate on your vomit and die. So here I was. <laughs> in this weird zone of fighting off death and wanting to give in to impending unconsciousness. Not a good place to be. 
After an eternity in the bathroom, on the brink of collapse, the RAs became understandably concerned and asked me if I wanted to go to the hospital. Using the only form of communication I could muster up, I nodded my head. So kids, that's how I became the first transport of the school year. At the emergency room, the EMTs were hilariously incompetent at sticking an IV in my arm. The look on my dad's face, though, coming to the ER from my mom's room a few stories above, well, that was not so hilarious. Eventually, the EMTs handed me off to my dad. No big deal. They may as well have poured gasoline on me and lit me on fire because he was ready to kill me. He carried me up to my mom's room where she lay in her hospital bed, hooked up to IVs and strange beeping machines, and she looked at me like I was a pathetic wannabe. I mean, here she was, on the verge of death, yet she was so angry she was ready to take me with her. My mom had raised me to respect myself, not to simply become a label or stereotype, and I had let her down. Despite the chewing out I was getting, I slept like a baby that night. Maybe all I had wanted was to spend the night with my family and my subconscious just thought of a really fucked up way to make it happen. I had to make the walk of shame back to my dorm the morning after, hospital bracelet included, and even though everyone at the dorm was really nice about it, I felt like they just saw me as a transport. Even my parents thought I was just a burnout, and that hurt the most. It was that day I decided I would never let anything so mortifying happen to me again. I worked hard to prove to my dorm mates that I deserve to be here, that I'm an intelligent, kind, funny person who doesn't always make poor decisions, always being the key word. I worked to make strong connections with the people around me, a characteristic my mom valued most in her own life. And even though she passed away a few months later, I think she forgave me. Sorry. <laughs> I'm not done yet. Hold up. <laughs> this is a tough thing. Um, <laughs> She never got to see it, but I became a new Elisa, a successful Stanford student who still goes to parties occasionally, but seeks to understand who someone is as a whole, not the label that they are assigned. I would only hope that people do the same for me, because I am more than a transport. Thank you. Let's give it up for Elisa. So I'm very honored to not only welcome the next person, but also share her story with you. This is Angela Zhang. Lonely, frustrated, and confused. That's where I found myself during week six of my summer internship in Burma. I arrived in Burma eager and excited, but left with a lost sense of self, drive, and motivation. During my internship, my supervisor continually put me down and asserted his superiority. I could tell you about a time when his six foot five frame towered over my desk as I nervously edited a report, bracing for his loud and angry criticisms. I soon developed anxiety about the consequences of tiny day-to-day -day tasks. Unable to hold my own or even get out of bed, I fled to the airport and left two weeks early, carrying the heavy burden of failure with me. My perfect image shattered as I began to see myself as someone who couldn't see any goal through completion. Upon returning home, I took small steps to remind myself that I could at least commit to something small. First, I committed to three months of daily yoga, reclaiming an old lifestyle that helped me gain a, a peaceful and balanced mind. I walked my dog each morning, and I even adopted a rescue kitten that gave me love and companionship. 
And with just one week to go, I unexpectedly chose to take the quarter off without any plans to graduate. Since then, I have learned to practice self-care and self-love, to celebrate both successes and failures, and to have confidence in, my, in myself, independent of how others treat me or look at me. I found that some things won't go as planned, and that's okay, because we're all human. And I realized the necessity of taking a step back to accept the possibility of failure viewing it as an opportunity rather than a burden. It turns out I'm still graduating this June, but even if I weren't, I'm now in a place where I'm comfortable taking the time I need to pursue my goals and my dreams while being holistically healthy and happy in the process, rising again after potential falls here and there. Please welcome Angela. Last but not least, I would like to introduce you to John Schiavone with an incredible story, not only about resilience and determination, but true self-worth. Please give him a hand. Oh, 
06. Oh, six, that was our rallying cry. Year of our Lord, John Hennessy, 2002. <laughs> it was a cry of solidarity. It was a cry that promised great things, a cry that celebrated Stanford. The ink hadn't even dried on our senior high school yearbooks. Future so bright, gotta wear shades. Oh, six! But that cry meant something very different. Lying in a hospital bed, winter quarter, 2005. Oh, six was a year and a half away, but it might as well have been forever. In a room to the right, a girl wasting away on an IV because she still refused to eat. In a room to the left, a 40-year-old man addicted to painkillers, sobbing quietly in the midnight hours. And here in this bed, a 20-year-old college student who had everything, who had been given everything, and now he's lying here awake, having almost thrown it all away, and he's still wondering if he made the wrong choice. Oh, six? He's only here because when the counselor at CAPS asked him for the truth, he was stupid enough to be honest. Because... Maybe, finally, this duck couldn't tread water anymore. Because maybe, finally, this fucking duck was gonna drown. Because maybe, finally, the urge to reach out ever so slightly outweighed the desire to destroy itself. That stupid idiot in the bed is me in case you hadn't figured it out. I screwed up. There was no going back. My mother was on a plane, the first she could get. She was on her way, and I had no idea what I was gonna tell her. Sorry? Oh, 06. No more. Oh, 06. They prepare you for everything here, except for what to do when you fail but they don't give up on you. Come back in a year, they said. Well, it took me 10, but here I am. Because there is no going back, but there is always a way forward. We are not the summation of our failures, we are the choices we make in spite of them. It ain't catchy, but I'll take 17. <laughs> this is my story, but there's one more thing I need to tell you, and it begins with a terrible secret. We are all alone. But we are all alone together. We each have a different journey, but we walk alongside. I'm still here, and you're here in this space with me. I am reaching out my hand to you. I am asking you to take it, and I am telling you it will be okay. When your body is too heavy to get out of bed, it will be okay. When you're in the shower and your lungs breathe so fast that they cannot pull in air, it will be okay. When someone you loved leaves you, now or forever, you will keep on living. It will be okay. Because you're still here and I'm still here. 
And as long as that's true, we'll all be okay. To sing our finale song, I'd like to bring up my fellow classmate 11, Mr. Aaron Grayson. Thank you so much for coming. Have a great evening. Stay strong, stay powerful, and remember to always do you. Hello, it's me I've been studying all night for this And all I get I see This exam was everything My whole life revolves around my grades And 12 activities So here's the moment That we decide the duck, it stops right here. Hello from my better side. My fears, my flaws, I try to hide. But I wore this mask for my failures too long. So that's why I need you to help sing this song. Hello, I'm here In this California sunshine that is drying up my tears I'll admit it, there's fear Of not feeling like I'm happy all the time So what's the deal? In this moment, we celebrate just being who we are. Hello from my better side. My fears, my flaws, I try to hide. But I wore this mask for my failures too long. So that's why I need you to help sing this song again. Hello from my better side. My fears, my flaws, I try to hide. But I wore this mask for my failures too long. And that's why I need you to help sing song Whoa. 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 Hello from my bed side time hello from my better side my fears my flaws I try to hide but that's why I do not bear you too long and that's why I need you to help sing this song and be bold Stanford, I screwed up 2016. Thank you so much for coming. And have a great night. Yay.